chosen to test this station's destructive power on your home planet of Ord. Then name the system Ord. Loki religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good flight. Start to coming up on Alderaan. You may fly when ready. Welcome to Alderaan Explosion. Explosion Network's official countdown to Star Wars Episode 9, The Rise of Skywalker. It's 54 days until release. My name is Dylan Blight, your Jedi Master, and joining me, my Padawans, Ashley Hobley. Hey Dylan, excited to be here to talk about the best droid in Star Wars movies, K2SO. Debatable. And Kieran Marchant. Hey Dylan and Ashley, I'm here to talk to you about Save It Private Ryan of the Star Wars universe. That's the one. That's, I'd like to bring it back. Who, who is Private her. Ryan in your mind in this analogy? Um, Galen Erso. No, no. Private Ryan is the, the USB is the USB stick with the Death Star plans. Got him. It's more like a floppy drive, really. You're well, taking yes. it home, so it's because its previous three brothers died in war as well. Yep. Ashley, you're reading too far into the analogy, my friend. Okay. In case you didn't know, this week's episode, we are discussing the first Star Wars story, the first Star Wars spin-off movie, uh, Rogue One. I, I want to bring it back to Ash's thing before, because how much did you laugh when I replied to your tweet about him being the, the, the best thing, and I found that Rebels clip of someone with Chopper from uh, Rebels the Animated Series, and Chopper's like, what the fuck? And then someone like put this... The- <laughs> <laughs> the fucking font over it, which Chopper says, what the fuck? Um, Chopper's a better droid than... I did specifically one. say movies. Okay. I'm going to get all... Pedantic. About pedantic money. about it. Just be careful what you're doing. Because we uh, all know all right, the so droid from uh, the Old Republic is the best one. Anyway, move on. Oh, it's not canon, so you can't count that. Um, when was the... Yes, it is. So... <laughs> as, as always, when was the last time you watched Rogue One? And now, upon this rewatch, how do you uh, feel about it at the moment? Kieran, let's start with you. Um, I can't remember the last time I watched Rogue One. I've watched it a couple times since it was released, at least three or four times. But I can't remember exactly when that was, so maybe one to two years ago, possibly. Um, and I love this movie. Like, I really like This is one of my favorite Star Wars movies. Um... So yeah, I I, I I like it as much as I loved it then. Nothing's changed. Hot diggity damn. Um Ash. Yeah, I don't think I'd seen it since we probably watched it for the last time we did these. Uh still great movie, still really enjoyed it, still probably one of the best looking Star Wars movies, I'd say. Oh, it's so good. <sighs> I think it's top two. Easily. Oh, just on vi- away. Are you, no, wait, wait, top two on visuals, you're saying, though? Or top two yeah. overall? Okay. No, top two v- for visuals. For like, visuals. Yeah. For, what else are you putting up there, then? I think the cinematography in this is, like, top-notch. It's probably the best. Up With Again, what? top two and, like, well-designed and that kind of thing. It is. Last yeah, Jedi. Is, last is Jedi that what you're comparing secret- it to? Last Jedi? With, yeah, the, like, it's those two. <laughs> last Jedi cinematography was fucking amazing. Like, I will die on that hill if when people argue with Last Jedi. Yeah. Like, Rogue just, One. Uh, I'm not even getting into that yet. No. Rogue One just, it just worked perfectly. It did the job that it was meant to do, fill in this perfect gap and explain why they were able to blow up the Death Star with just one small vent. It and it did. wasn't just, it wasn't just a uh, coincidence that it was there. It made a good movie out of a single crawl better than solo like it was better than solo and it all it had was that crawl like in what, the paragraph what, what paragraph did even, solo come from solo didn't come from anything i don't know i don't know where those comparisons came from i just wanted to take it i guess it solo it came from that single <laughs> line about the kessel run that's the whole yeah, something about the kessel run yeah, yeah yeah it's from all the han solo lore and all the han solo parts in movies we've seen how he got his name, because we all, as we discussed, we all asked that question. We were like, how did he get his name? Um, but, yeah. This the same movie- way they named the ship in this movie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I haven't watched it. I haven't watched it since 2017 for the first run Ooh. of this Old podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, first run of Old Run. But, also, it is... It is the Star Wars movie out of like 
any of Last Jedi, Force Awakens, Solo is the one I watched the fastest out of the cinema. Like looking at my track, I believe it's like December 15th, 2016. 0016 is when I checked in. So obviously the midnight release there. And then the next one, December 15th. 1400. So <laughs> two o'clock the same day. <laughs> as far as I what I remember is watching the midnight release, going to um getting home, going to bed. No, going home, recording a YouTube video talking about how much I love the movie. And it was like 3 a.m., 4 a.m. by the time I got done doing that. And then I went to bed and then I woke up at whatever time. And as soon as I rolled over, grabbed my phone, I was like thinking about the movie straight away i'm like oh that was such a good movie i just pulled out my phone i'm like because i had the day off work i just opened up the, the starting times and there was a movie there was another screening starting in like an hour so i just like all right i'm off <laughs> <laughs> i'm off the scene away so that's the fastest out of any of the movies i have seen so yeah i, I quite enjoy this movie loved it um watched it from loved it from the moment it came out and every time i watch it i still really really enjoy watching it and i think as my notes will kind of pertain, I, th- I think rewatches now are just me picking up small little details that I'm becoming um, better at appreciating to do with like character stuff and like how well they've kind of like a lot of the, what may seem like tropey kind of characters are actually subverted, which I kind of wrote down in my notes here, which I enjoy. Make 10 men feel like a hundred. Take the next chance. And the next. You're rebels, aren't you? Save the rebellion! Save the dream! First thing I wrote down is blue milk. What a crazy thing that is! <laughs> <laughs> it's not only for Ash mentioning on whatever prequel movie it was, but I was like, wasn't that blue milk in the thing? <laughs> I mean, there was blue milk in Solo as well. Yeah, when they're in the, st- they were talking to Lando for the first time, just then. Okay, Didn't so, mention yeah. it then, but yeah, blue milk then. Oh, okay, so yeah, ripped out. Uh, the next thing I wrote down is Krennic is a fuck and I love him for it. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you hell. what, this, <laughs> this is, this role revitalized Ben Mendelsohn's career, really. It, it, and now he's playing. He's the exact played same that character. role he's, four times since. I literally yeah. watched. I randomly watched uh, that new Robin Hood film. Yes, he plays the same. Taron, and he plays the same character when he's playing the sherry for not a good minute. I'm like, yep. oh, you found your niche. Okay, fair enough, buddy. Yeah, and then he played the same role in Ready Player One. Yep, and then Captain we Marvel. all thought he was going to play the same role in Captain Marvel. He did to a point, I guess, without going into spoilers, but. Um. Yeah, he's basically been playing the same. Especially Ready Player One is just, but none of those were as good as this because this character is written better, and it was the first time. And bit of, I feel bit like of bias you're biased. All, you're, you're biased, biased as fuck there. I feel like because I am you've biased. read the you. I remember you read some book setting it prequel book before Rogue One. Yeah, which I I didn't write down my notes because obviously we talked about it last time. But it's impossible for me not to watch this movie. And as I just said, this is what my this is my fifth time total watching it. I guess um, five times watching this, and every single time the movie starts, I've I've never once watched this movie without knowing what the fuck is happening, which is which has always been my thing. Because I remember reading reviews and people being like, "The movie starts so weird," and like, "Who are these characters?" And you know, people are running around, blah 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 blah. And I always found it so odd because yeah, you you read that prequel novel, uh, Catalysts, yeah, Rogue One Catalyst, I think is the book which introduces you to Galen, Lyra, their daughter, like um, when they're working for their empire and the book ends with them running away, going to hide on a planet. So then, of course, I read that book and I'm sitting in theater in midnight release. The ship's flying in. You see Lyra, uh, you see Jin running along. I'm like, oh, like here comes Krennic to come get them back. You know, like it, it really felt like watching the the sequel to something, really, because <laughs> you hadn't read the book. So, uh, but, you know, when it comes to Krennic and... Um, Ben Mendelsohn I just feel like every every other time he does this sort of role Ready Player One or whatever maybe it is because this is the first time like this is like the template yeah so the rest of those times feel just like copycat performances yeah and, and obviously he's being directed maybe they're not using the exact words act like you did in Rogue One but like no, he's being directed to fill that choice. role 
yeah, it's a casting choice for sure. But it's like it, none of those ever feel as good as he does in this role because this is obviously the original, you know? Yeah. You're and, a, but how many different ways can you act? You are a conniving uniform wearing man. Like you're, I guess he's, he's just been typecast a lot since this movie. Like even since last time we just discussed it, I think he's just been typecast a lot for this role. Yeah. And I, I feel do think like he brings Captain a lot Marvel to this role. Uh, I haven't seen... He's got a couple of other Australian movies coming out this year. so I hope they're different, yeah. No, no it's just more the Hollywood type stuff. And even like when I went in to see this, I already knew who Ben Molston was because I was a big fan of um, Animal, Animal Kingdom. Kingdom. Yes. Like I was a big, big, big fan of that movie. So I was going in like, Ben Molston, this is going to be great. I, I'd seen him in other stuff, but Animal Kingdom's like what my mind would go to when I thought about Ben Mendelsohn and Ben Mendelsohn in Animal Kingdom is nothing like he is in this. More so how he is in this is more, I guess, in the direction of like him in Dark Knight Rises, I guess. Yeah. And that's kind of like what more Holly, more general audiences would probably remember him from. Because in case you don't know, if you got to like kind of tickle your memory brains over here, if you don't remember, in Dark Knight Rises, he's one of like the schemey dudes that like Bane the financial deals people. with. Yeah. Financial people that Bane is dealing with. And he's kind of playing a twerp as well. He's not playing a leader type because, of course, Bane, like, kind of death stares him and he pees his pants. Well, he doesn't really, but, like... <laughs> probably does. <laughs> he probably does, yeah. <laughs> let's, let, let's be honest. Um, yeah, so he, he, he's really good, though. And he, he does bring a lot to the role. And I think... And I, I, I kind of discuss it... I think I bring it up here at some point, but I might as well just bring it up now. Um, like last week where I was talking about reading these Fraun books, in the most recent Fraun book, they have... Krennic in it quite a lot um, because it's the 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 most recent Fraun books basically like long story short Fraun's whole thing is he's trying to put, come up with new versions of TIE fighters called TIE defenders and he wants money for that project and they're basically TIE fighters that have like shields and stuff crazy concept right um, <laughs> who'd have thought uh, so he wants money for that and then of course Krennic wants money for um, Operation Stardust, which is the the De- Death Star. Now Tarkin wants the Death Star project. That's the whole thing with Tarkin. They've added in extended universe materials, like his book and other books. Even the Catalyst novel goes into how like Tarkin is over here, sort of involved with the Death Star because that's introduced even in Episode Three, of course, with Vader looking at like they they have that sort of dodgy CGI Tarkin in Revenge of the Sith, but it doesn't look that bad because of course he's he walks off before the camera gets like too close. Um, to him, but like Tarkin's always been like, I want the Death Star project. And in that book, it's all about having like Krennic, Tarkin's basically trying to make Krennic fight and all, uh, Thrawn and all this sort of stuff. But the way they write, you can tell a character and a character has been set by an actor, you know, like, and Ben Mendelsohn makes Krennic, makes that character when the way that character has been written and portrayed in the audio book and everything is someone's just trying to do a Ben Mendelsohn thing, you know? like, And that's because there is no way else you can write or perform the role of Krennic because Krennic is, in in this one movie, as much as people will, like may not think he's as big as like a Darth Vader or something, like an epic character, there's no, he is a character set in stone because Ben Mendelsohn does play Krennic so well. It's like if you have, I, I had something similar for another series that I was listening to on Audible and it was a series that I had read growing up as a kid and I fucking loved it. And I had my own very ideas or like, you know, voices that I would hear when I read the book. And I found it so jarring in while listening to the audio podcast where um, the, the narrator would do such a fucking weird version of a set of characters voices Mm. that would just like, I would find completely, just jarring to a point where it would almost stop me from listening to the book. Um, once you've got, uh, once there is a set idea of what a character is, I think it's really hard for people to try and reinvent it or to change it. Um, and if, yeah, it would be weird to try and make something different of it once he's set um, kind of like the, the goalposts for what Krennic is. Yeah. I think I, yeah. In one movie, I think it's like kind of a step, like a triumphant thing to like kind of make a character that known to your audience's mind after one performance, you know? So I think that's quite impressive. And it, it just comes from all the things because we've seen Tarkins and whatever else, m- more like proper 
politician-y type things. But then in comes a dude wearing a giant white cape who's like, it's my project. You know, like he has a bit more and he definitely stands out amongst the, yeah. the ranks of what you're used to seeing as far as like emperor, uh, imperial type workers and stuff. So, yeah. Um, mm. Next thing I wrote down is, I hope the Cassian show is kind of like his first scene. Lots of spy stuff, shows how bad the rebellion is at times. And then I've, I want to talk about what we want out of the Cassian and or Disney Plus show, which they have announced. And I think they're supposed to start shooting uh, either towards the end of this year or like early next year or something like that. Yeah. We don't know anything about it. We know that um, K2 and Cassian are going to be in it. We don't know exactly where it's going to be set. Now, before you're like, oh, it's going to be how they meet. Uh, that story has been covered in the comic. Not to say they couldn't redo it for um, live action, of course, but but they, they've they've explained that story. So I don't know if they that's the road they want to go down because it's not very interesting. But would you be excited for? Are you excited for a Cassian Andor story? Uh, Cassian, <laughs> maybe that's what it's going to be called. Uh, Cassian Andor series, Ash. And what would you like to see out of it? Yeah, I'm I'm keen for this. Um... One Diego Luna doesn't seem like he's going to age anytime soon, so he can play that probably character for no. a while before the events of this film. Um, but I think what I want is him to be the bushy-eyed, bright-eyed guy joining the rebellion at the start, and then working as a spy slowly, taking pieces of his soul, soul away. Yeah, okay. that's which, what I want to see. Which is kind which, of messed up, but yes. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying though. Yeah, and I'm like trying to work out like how far would they set that, or whatever. And they they may not they may need uh, they may not only have to set that like two years prior to this. You know, like there's there's no reason to say he's been a spy the fucked up someone. spy he's been for so long. Like he, he could have just been the last couple of years, and he could have you know what I mean. Like you don't need to say he's been doing this since he was like 15, like fucking shooting yeah, people, no. like innocent people, like he does at Star's movie. But I I definitely want the the TV series. Uh, focused on him to definitely feel like more like this first opening scene where you you see him literally kill an innocent person. He's informant, yeah. Yeah, he's informant. Like, and that's something we never saw. That's one of the things that's so good about this movie. It's like he's, it shows you things that m- make you go, okay, they are the good guys, but the good guys also have people doing bad things. You know, so I hope that's what that show dives into. Um, Kieran, what would you be excited? Are you going to be excited for that? For I that would one? be. I'd, I'd be excited for it as long as um, it continues to do what this movie does, which is bring a gritty realism to the Star Wars world. Because I think even in Star Wars in general, Star Wars as a general franchise is very um, almost clinical and very clean in many ways. Um, there's not much about the the human struggle or the actual like the the fucked up shit that people had to do for rebellions and stuff so um i would i would want to see that i want to see the darker side of the star wars universe not talking about the dark side but like that the other we've side got of movies the coin. about that <laughs> yeah we've got movies about that i want to see that the other side of the coin of what are the things that the rebels had to do in the name of good to take down the empire do we actually want it to be like an, a proper spy thing? And by that, I mean like, because in this, he talks about being a spy, but it's, he's like, I don't want James Bond. No, no, no. But like, do you want to see him actually like go undercover somewhere for like a long period of time or something? Um, Not for a long period, maybe like an episode no. or something. But I'd like for him yeah, to maybe episode, have like so. a arc in like where he's like in a city or a certain place and he's got a target or an objective he has to, um, you know, achieve and just his stories of how he, what lengths he has to go to achieve them or maybe following one person to various places around the galaxy um, could be a possibility. The the, the other interesting thing when like speculating about any of these Disney Plus shows is because we haven't watched one yet, we don't know like how exactly they're going to feel. Like is from what we can kind of gather about the Mandalorian, it definitely feels like it's kind of just going to be like one, you know, long movie. Story, you know yeah. what I mean? Like one long story. And obviously I think that's what Obi-Wan's going to be as well. But then it's like, is that kind of the standard then? Is the standard for Disney Plus Star Wars shows going to be, they basically are six to 10 hour long uh, movies just in a TV series? Or could something like the Cassian series, would that 
be better suited to like here's a three episode arc and then let's go ahead like six months and here's another three to four episode arc you know what i'm saying like do they all need to be the same like really long movies or play around with different types like what do you think would work better for a cassian thing long movie or arcs like i think arcs would work better because i don't see I don't believe it depends on where the starting point is for his character. If he is the, as Ash suggested, the bushy eyed um, kid that wants to help the rebellion. And it's about how the, he turns into this hardened spy that is ready to do the darker things to get the job done. I think that would take longer arcs to get through. That wouldn't just happen in one story. Um, but if it's about like a midpoint of his existence as a spy, then it would be fine as one story. Yeah. Because it's like, the when he kills that dude here, like the, his informant, he does it no fucks given. And you don't just get to that stage, you know? Like, there definitely has to be a moment in his life where he has to make some decision like that, and it's a struggle. Then I guess once he crosses that line from that moment on, it becomes a lot easier for him to do, you know? Um, all right, so back to the notes here. I wonder how general moviegoers will react to Saw in Jedi Fallen Order and if we'll see any other notable characters like Two Tubes in that game. So h- how are we feeling about, um, a couple episodes later in, in this season, we're hopefully going to have time to discuss somewhat uh, the game um, in one of the, between some episodes. But how, how are we feeling about Jedi Fallen Order and in particular, like having a character like Saw show up? Because audience reaction to him, I think in this movie was kind of like, like I would say like no one particularly loved him I quite enjoy seeing him in this because obviously he was a character from Clone Wars and I thought it was really cool that they were doing that like connective fabric of bringing an animated character to to live action but then they also did really cool things in like when Rogue One was air uh I think when Rebels returned like it was on a mid-season break when Rogue One came out so when like that when Rebels came back in like January the next couple episode arc of Rebels had Saw in it but it was obviously years before Rogue One takes place, which like meant he wasn't as batshit crazy, and he like his body wasn't quite as bad and messed up and reliant on the machine that he has in Rogue One. So I kind of like how they kept playing with different periods of how crazy uh, Saw gets, and I think that's what makes him an interesting character because he goes from being like a I'm on board with the the rebels to a like you aren't being like he goes from that to no we'll just bomb cities and we'll fight like the full-on like crazy um stuff that he ends up doing in this movie of course but yeah do you are you looking forward to seeing him in the game do you think that's going to be a, a thing that works well for people ash as long as it works for the story i don't care either way i mean it's cool that he's being included but as long as he's a it works within the story of fallen order i'll be happy to have him there if it, it, if it works here. I think the problem with Saul in this movie was that this is probably the majority of Star Wars fans' first interaction with him, and the version we got was the batshit crazy one. And I think that's really hard to get. And it wasn't even like it wasn't even like a likable batshit crazy. Like sometimes you can get characters that are batshit crazy, but you you know you you'll like them. And I don't think he's supposed to be a likable batshit crazy character. No, I, d- character. I don't think he's supposed to be likable. No, I think he's, he's not. He's yeah. supposed to be that gritty, tough, kind of really fucked up person who's been through some shit. But I think that was so hard for some people to kind of accept in a Star Wars movie and get across. I'm excited to see him. I like seeing him in other forms where he is his earlier self. He is a, a lot different character. Um, and I think it would have been more interesting for people if they'd seen uh, a different version of him first and then this version to get like the kind of the yeah well contrasts the, you don't get no con- you get no contrast because the you you're introduced to him at the start of the movie of course when he like saves Jin but you don't get to like hear him talk or like like see what he was like when he was with young Jin it's yes, like yeah. automatically we skip ahead in time and next time you see him he's his hair's a bit different or whatever else, and he's batshit crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I think, yeah, I, I think with the game, I'm going to be in- intrigued how people react, though, because, yeah, I, I just felt like he was a, when when he came out, people had different opinions of him, and then 
We'll see. We'll, we'll see how it goes. I, I'm enjoying that he's in it because I think he's an interesting character. What kind of like how I was talking about with the solo episode. I kind of like seeing different uh, factions within like the the rebellion and how they all work. Um, a part of the Rebel Alliance. Well, in Saul's case, not a part of the Rebel Alliance because he's so batshit crazy that they kicked him out. Uh, yeah. All right. So back to the notes over here. Mentioned Fraun, uh, okay, that's my, no, no, we, we can skip that one. That was my note about the Fraun stuff, which we basically went over before. Um, <laughs> next thing I wrote down was, are you kidding me? I'm blind, <laughs> which as much as many times as I've watched this movie, it still makes me laugh. And I think it's just Donnie Yen's delivery of that, like as the bag's been putting over these, he's just like, are you kidding me? I'm blind. It's so funny. Um, Give me a Chirrut and Bears series, miniseries. Oh, they're like, oh, for me, would watch those, the fuck two, out of that. <laughs> those two are almost as interesting for me as companions as Chewie and Han. Like, they're on that same level for me of, I fucking love this relationship and their friendship, and I want to see more. Like, it sucks that they're only in this one movie. Yeah, I'd love to see more of them. they it's they work so well together they have lots of charisma obviously well i think it mostly comes from donnie yen to be honest like he's the kind of like the leading factor of this but um and then also just within like the star wars universe having introducing like a a character that's not a jedi but like is one with the force and you know like it's obviously just a really unique character from that front and kind of expands what force users can be because obviously yeah. most people think like force users are just jedi it's like what's what's we'll that but then you've you've got these people over here so um next thing i wrote down is that escape scene and the death star is full of emotion i i remember that's another thing that i don't kind of get sick of watching is their escape from jedi and just seeing that planet exploding and, what, and everything that's happening there. I really think this is... I just love this way this scene is put together. Because, of course, you know the Death Star is destructive. We've all seen A New Hope. We know it can blow up fucking planets. But I think there's just something about this scene. And just seeing the slow, drawn-out, destructive ability of it. And actually seeing people have to escape that from a uh, planet front. And then the way the scene mm. just plays out reminds me of like a Roland Emmerich. Like, end-of-the-world type escape scene. You know, like... 2001 yeah. or like some 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 shit like that where they're this is the first everywhere. time we've seen it like from the planet every other time yeah. we've seen it in a movie we've seen it from yes a distance you know this yes, is the space. first time that the destruction of the death star is humanized in any way like before that it's sci-fi it's a little plastic planet being blown up to smithereens in a plastic a practical effect that yep. doesn't, you know, that doesn't, you know, you can't tell that there's people there. They, they'll tell you, oh, yeah, there's people there. But your brain and your emotions do not register that until you watch these people go through this shit. And this is that grittiness to this movie that I think really puts it, you know, that ch- steps it out from the other Star Wars movies. But even in yeah. Force Awakens, they showed it from a distance. They didn't show, like, they cut they show, to yeah. the- They cut to the one shot of the people looking out on the balcony and then... But that's it. They didn't. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So this one definitely um, hit harder. I think. Yes, I think so. Even and if it's just it was so less haunting. damage, technically. Yeah, and it's just so haunting too, because when you see like that, the Death Star can't just roll over to above Jeddah. Like, I just love the way everything. This movie is like, as you're saying before, like one of the best shot movies, but also they use their special effects so well. Like within, it has a sense of scale that. I don't think many of the other Star Wars movies get right. The image of the uh, battle cruiser over the top of the Jeddah s- of Jeddah, oh Jeddah is, City, yeah, uh, of the city, yeah, yeah, is like I I think for many people that's the first time you re- you get a true sense of how fucking big one of these ships is. Yeah. Um, well, they're always just up in space, which is hard to get a sense of scale because yeah, you're like yeah, your mind they're only up against other spaceships. Yeah, and you're like, how do I bring that down to like a real world relatable scale? And even yeah. like, you know, oh, but you've seen ships in like Coruscant. And I'm like, yeah, but Coruscant isn't like, there's no sense of size to Coruscant because it's a fucking giant city. Like you don't, you to actually see that city and then just to have that looming vessel over the top of it is fucking, it was just, it's, it's really, really nice to see. Also, yeah. from d- an engineering I point, I'd be interested to see how they kept that like hovering above the city for so long. Yeah. D- well, 
Yeah, I don't know. Just burning <laughs> yeah, through I def- this fuel. I definitely feel like Rogue One just has lots of imagery that we hadn't seen in any movies before and we haven't seen since. Uh, be that the, the destroyer looming above the city or like the way it shoots the, the Death Star coming in and just makes it really feel like this actual Death Star, you know, like truly scary fucking thing that just if you if you see that thing float above your planet it's like <laughs> fuck my life <laughs> yeah mm. it's it, it makes it scary for once because and i think this comes down to like in a new hope when old Ryan's destroyed leia the way they've kind of retconned it and they've explained this in like they, they did a leia comic book that's basically about her trying to track down the the remaining old Iranian people and I really enjoyed that comic because it has a whole thing where those people are like, why aren't you more upset? Like, why haven't you been crying? Like, they're doing that whole thing of being like, Leia, you should be more upset. Why aren't you as upset about the des- destruction of a planet as we all are? And they, they kind of force that on her. And it comes down to her being like, well, I wasn't allowed to be upset in the moment. You know, I had to be strong and so on and so forth. I don't think they were thinking about that when they made the movie originally. No, but they but can go like, back and fix it. Yeah, in, in like retconny type can, canon stuff, If I whenever we watch A New Hope, Hope Now, which we will be next week, um, whenever I view that scene, I'm not like, why isn't Leia crying? Why isn't she breaking down? I always view it as like a... She's she does want to. She's very upset, obviously, but like she's such a strong character that she's literally trying to stay strong to like because of where she is and the position she's in, and she she obviously doesn't want to give Tarkin or Vader any signs of weakness at all. So, um, and because of the way they do that in the New Hope, though, you never get if she broke down in a New Hope. I feel like it would have added to like destruction of the Death Star and like how powerful it is and blah 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 blah. But because she's our one good character in that scene it then means that we as an audience never truly get the the scale of emotion that we get through rogue one and what it does for the death star it also happens like the death star blowing up alderaan happens so early in the movie and in the franchise like it and you, you don't really get a weight of what the fuck just happened like you don't it doesn't translate the humanity of it and i think like this this movie I can. I don't think I can ever say for any other Star Wars movie, except for maybe, maybe one moment in the Last Jedi, have I ever felt scared watching a Star Wars movie? Like, have I ever felt some kind of fear or or a trepidation about something? Where this movie really peaks that in me several times throughout the viewing, where these moments of just despair and just pure everything's fucked. We're all we're all fucked here. Like, there's no, yeah. There's there's just so it just isn't something that happens regularly in a Star Wars movie, which I find really refreshing in this one. Yeah, they the movie like taking that one thing from like Nicole of New Hope. It the the entirety of Rogue One really is like building into you a sense of dread and realization of just how dire the situation was as you go into watching a New Hope. Like with that, I I really do feel like this movie makes a new hope better because it adds like all this emo- emotional depth and um, knowledge that you kind of didn't have before, but you could only just assume. Uh, so the next thing I wrote down was it's actually rather underappreciated part of the movie that Urso doesn't fall into this stereotype of the only one that can build the thing. So this is another thing I kind of just noticed this time. Uh, I was really appreciating watching it this time was that you may think that Galen Erso falls into that very shitty, like scientist stereotype of the only one in the whole world that can somehow build the thing and no one else can do it for some reason. And it may seem like he's that at first, but he's actually not. And I I do think that's important into like his whole story and the, 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 the whole thing about him, uh, basically staying there and working and building in this trap and so on and so forth. Like, him talking about how he realized they didn't need him anymore, but he's able to play the part and make them think that they need him so he can, he can then build in the trap. But I, I I do think that a lot of people don't realize or never saw that, like, he isn't actually a very stereotypical character. Like, yes, he's smart. That's the whole thing. He is smart. He's like, obviously, he was brought in because he was a smart scientist, dude. But they never fall into the stereotype of making Galen one of the only people in the world that can do the thing because reasons, you know? So... I, don't, I, I kind of really appreciate that they're able to ride around these rather boring stereotypes. Um, next thing I wrote down was, ah, the Mustafa scene. The Mustafa scene. So 
good. That's all I have to say. Oh, and I'm glad they extended this castle in the comics in the Vaden VR game now. So I love this scene, obviously. It's really cool. I think looking back on it now, a couple of years since I've watched it, I find it interesting that, you know, because the first time you're watching Rogue One, you see the ship flying in, you're like, are we on? And because obviously they, they never put... That was the thing when it released, I remember. They never put the subtitle of the planet name. And that was always a, a thing that kind of annoyed me because every other planet you go to throughout the movie, they always put up a piece of text telling you you're on Jeddah, you're on this planet, you're on whatever planet you are. And when they go to Mustafa, M- Must- oh, fuck me. Mustafa. The hardest planet from Mustafa, the hardest planet for me to fucking say, apparently. Um, when they you're go a big there, Lion they. King they yeah, I am fucking... It's old Disney. Um, when they go there, they never put up the title card. And I remember after the film released, everyone was like messaging. I could see all these people on Twitter like adding the Star Wars story group people and all these things being like, is it this, is it that? Because we all assumed where it was, but the movie never actually fucking confirmed. And everyone was like, we're 99% sure, but we just want that 1% confirmation, which we got later. But this was like, day of release of course and the reason they didn't put the text up on the screen to tell you is because they wanted it to be more of a shocking moment when um vader's revealed of course and the other thing about this is rogue one is the film that introduces the the whole idea of vader having this castle there which they've continued to build upon after the fact through like the the vader comics that was talking about episodes ago whatever one that was revenge of sith or whatever um, and how in that Darth Vader comic, they show how Vader goes there, why he builds his castle there. Um, and it's basically because there's this giant Sith source power there that he's trying to drain energy from. Um, the Vader VR game, which episode two is out now, and I haven't played it yet as of recording for this episode. Um, but the whole thing about that Vader VR game is it's about Vader basically trying to find once again he's just obsessed with being able to bring padme back to life like he's trying to find a way through the abilities that that place can give him to bring padme back to life so it's not like random castle or whatever but yeah within the context of this movie it is still just such a cool scene flying in Kranich there vader comes out well the, the whole back to tank scene is cool just to see him like Yes, he does get out of the suit and like <laughs> try and attempt to heal up a little bit because that's the whole thing with Vader is like his body's just constantly in pain, you know. Like so, like the the, the back to suit, the back to tank thing is like healing him is just kind of like a soothing salt bath, like I guess to try and help uh, keep the pain away somewhat. Um, and then when he comes out with Krennic, and I remember, and I I love it now, but I remember when it released and the whole Vader line of where he turns around, he's like, be careful not to choke on your aspirations, Director Krennic. I remember when the movie released, a lot of people would be like, oh, that's so corny for Vader to say. No, uh, fuck off. It is, I love it. Where he turns around, he's just got his hands out, like in that like claw position because he's holding uh, Krennic's throat. I love it. Yeah. How how do you feel about this whole, this whole scene, this watch, this watch now? I think it's one of those uh, scenes that, this movie didn't need to, and it still would have been a good movie. Like you could take this part out, and it would still be a good movie. Yes, but it adds so much to this, and there is a portion of this movie that I freaking rave about because when and I raved about it last time we talked about this when we did the the uh, last season of Ultron Explosion where we watched this where it explains so much about Darth Vader leading into a new hope that it, it it's really it's really nice just to have these small touches of things that are happening to Vader and the things that he goes through or like the, just the you know the normal stuff like using the tank that is not something that's heavily featured a lot in the just the mainstream Star Wars movies that is really nice just to have it there yeah, I enjoyed it. I mean, to a certain extent, it would be cool to have se- have not had Vader in the entire movie until that last five minutes. Like, have no reference to him, and then he shows up and wreaks havoc in that last five minutes, but I guess. And then for the marketing to have been not include Darth Vader at all, that would have been fucking epic. But they decided, obviously, to go the other way and sort of build up to that that moment at the end of the movie, so... I enjoyed it. It's cool. Mustafa looks Mustafa looks cool. 
<laughs> um, yeah, it's also just one of those things where it's like maybe they wanted to introduce it here because they'd been kicking around these like comic ideas and you know what I mean? Like they, yeah. this is like an entry point to the whole Vader castle thing. Yeah. Which they're able to I think they included it because they're like, hey, we want to put Darth Vader in this film. That will be oh, make sure that people. I, th- come I, see I this definitely movie. feel like I definitely feel like that's the starting point. But then it's like once they begin exploring and whatever else, it's like, well, if we introduce it here, then we can like kind of expand out here, maybe you know, like everything needs a starting point. Yeah. Um, next thing I wrote down was all the rebel rebels references are my fave. Um, of course, last week we talked about rebels. Big fan of the show. Still, every time I watch this movie, I still just get excited. Like, even the first time they go to Yavin and you can spot the ghost ship, like, up in the corner. I'm like, what's oh, the ghost ship? And then, like, um, the the best one, I think, though, or you also see the ghost ship shop um, when the battle, the battle of Scarif is happening and all the ships are, like, popping out of hyperspace. But my favorite one is still just, like, towards the end of the movie when um, Jin's, like, walking away after she gave her whole big speech and they said, no, we can't go to Ballot Scarf. You hear over the PA system with General um, Harris and Jula, please report to Redu. Well, General Harris. I was like, oh, they're saying Harris' name in the movie. <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> Shush. Uh, they released a Scarf map for the original Battlefront and watching the fight uh, kick off fills me with fond memories of it. So this was just a random thing. Like it was, the scene that made me write down this note is just the after they land in Scarif and like Jin and all that uh, are head inside the building and then they've got all the other guards or whatever they're waiting outside that one like bunker entrance way or whatever yep. and like that was a key point of the battlefront map and for whatever reason this this time I was watching the movie I was just like that was a fun map to play on I I that was that was good <laughs> that was good time because it was a free release they did like after Rogue One came out they're like here's a free map and I. I mean, I played it quite a bit because I was like, "This is a good map, and I enjoy playing on Scarif, and this is this is fun." Yeah, I played Battlefront. You know, I played Battlefront One way more than Battlefront Two. Is kind of what made me realize, weirdly, but yeah. Um, how so long they do you think about, it took them to build that that data center? Uh, a year. I don't know. That data center <laughs> is fucking terrible. Like, like just the management of the whole. Just don't even just. Ugh. See, the thing about Star Wars tech is it's a long time ago, so it's quite old. <laughs> <laughs> they got space chips, but the tech is old. Do you reckon there's like uh, a, gen- a, a a generator at the bottom? Like, that's why the water's going into the... Oh, I fucking don't know. <laughs> There'll be something keeping it cool. Yeah. Maybe. Oh, that makes sense. Like, yeah, the water goes in drives. there, and then it go- turns into steam and goes back up in there. Mm. It goes- that's why the, plan- the planet's not empty. <laughs> it's still got water on it. <laughs> Um, next thing I wrote down was that they talk about hyper, hyperspace tracking here on Scarif before The Last Jedi uses it. Uh, there's your connection for people that think that technology just randomly shows up in the movie. So I think this is kind of much like how I was talking about last week with the whole like subtle thing of, you know, Rebels where they mentioned the whole uh, cut off the ship, even if the windows breaks in the ship, like they, they show things in other things or like subtly mention them to like, and don't make a big deal about it, but then it's like for hardcore people who want to like find out ha- why a technology or thing does happen, they are like subtly pointing it in. So basically, when Jin's like searching through the files for um, the Death Star plans, and like she's reading off all the things, one of the things she reads off is uh, hyperspace tracking or whatever, which of course they use in the Last Jedi. Um, that's how the First Order is when they're chasing him. Yeah when they're chasing him and everyone was like, what the fuck this, Oh, this technology just randomly comes out of nowhere. What the fuck? No. So by introducing it in this and having it in the project files here, among all the other things that are like projects that are being worked on or explored or whatever, it's like the empire at the time was exploring the technology, but they obviously just hadn't um, fully worked it out. And then you're obviously supposed to assume that the first order manages to, finish off figure the technology or, and figure out what needs to be done to make it work. But I, I definitely feel like it's one of those things where it's appreciated that they're able to sprinkle something like this in Rogue One and then Last Jedi, Last Jedi comes out and it's like... Jedi? Jedi. Last Jedi. <laughs> Last Jedi. When Last Jedi comes out and it's like people are getting so upset about it, it's like they don't need to explain it in that movie because it would be a complete waste of time. But for people who do want to like figure everything out, and you know what I mean? It's like, here's your answer. They were working on the technology. It didn't just come out of their ass. And of course, it's sort of retconning, but at the same time, Rogue One did come out before 
<laughs> Last Jedi. You know what I mean? So yeah. there is like connective tissue across yeah. stuff and like people talking to one another. And of course, that's kind of what the um, story group's job, I guess, is yeah. you know to do these sorts of things and connect things together. And we also see together. see hyper hyperspace jumping ships ram into another. They ram into Lord Vader's ship at the end and sort of blow up, obviously, as a precursor, I guess. Like, they don't yeah. seem like they do much damage, oh, right. but they're yes, much yes. smaller. Yes, yes, yes. But yeah. So it's um, not a crazy notion. No. My next, talking about ramming. So yeah, so this movie, the next note I wrote down was, this movie has the most ham and out, of, out, out there space battle with all this tech in Rebels showing up like the hammerheads pushing a destroyer down. So... Yeah, that was another like. Uh, uh, I, guess. I have a quick question to ask. Yes, yes, yes. Episode three answer, or Rogue One space battle? Rogue, Rogue One. One. Rogue One. Okay, good. <laughs> You're like, okay, good. So we should see it above in the rankings. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, you were just gushing about episode three space battle. If you I don't think back, episode. So. I don't think episode three space battle is good. The thing I like about it. That we we see for a glimpse that I would like to see more of in hopefully episode nine. It's just you you see so many ships around, like more that more than that's even in the battle here at Rogue One. Like you see like a, a depth of field, like in a shot, and you just see ships fucking everywhere. And my hope is that they take something like that that we see in Revenge of the Sith, which is ships everywhere. And I just want to see that actually brought to life. Like show me a battle with that many ships. Like, I, I don't think the space battle in Revenge of the Sith is very good. It's just it gives me hints at a bigger battle that we hadn't actually seen before. There's no other movie that has that many ships as you see in that one frame. As I, yeah. That's what I reckon. There's one frame where you see a ton of ships and I think that's more ships than you see in any other movie. Do I think it's a better space battle? No. Okay. I, I just think it gives hints at something I want. Um. Yeah, so and the, the head hammerheads ship are, is great. Yes. <laughs> The hammer, the hammerheads are something that was introduced in Rebels, and that's another thing like, like connective tissue that I kind of appreciate. Once again, it's like th- they introduced these ships in Rebels prior to wrote like this the third season, I think, of Rebels or something like that. And of course, or no, second season, I think. And then like Rogue One is, it comes out or whatever, and it's like, where did these ships come from? And of course, you, you know, general movie going fan pr- probably doesn't even question where these ships come from or where they've been. But then it's like for those that care. They were introduced in Rebels, and it, it's I kind of just do appreciate it. there is some like connective tissue as we're talking about here. Um, the left hand does talk to the right hand between the different Star Wars projects somewhat, even if people don't think there's much uh, communication stuff happening here. And I do think it's very cool the idea of these ships being literally their job is to like fucking ram shit, <laughs> like, like that's the <laughs> that's their whole destination. Um, and then of course the last note I had down here was. The final ten minutes never gets old, and it sure doesn't. Like that, every I love, and it, I'd say the final ten minutes to me is kind of like, well, maybe the final fifteen, I guess. Like from the moment Jin um, and Cassian kind of start climbing that tower, you know the yeah. the um, the data tower, and that fantastic piece of music which I love, which is like just the. Duh, duh. It kind of sounds like Jaws, I guess, if you try and do it like that. But it's just like yeah, the way very, you like, just said it. Yeah, it, it, it was just Jaws. It was it like did, oh, it okay. did, I was like, fuck, it is Jaws. As soon as I started doing that, it sounds like Jaws. <laughs> but yeah, like, it's like this piece music kicks in right as they start doing that. That obviously starts building up the tension, and then they start killing off the characters left, right, here, there. Um, Jin gets up top, does the thing that she needs to do, and then yeah, it's like from the moment the Death Star shows up, and you're just like, oh. You know what's happening. Like, you, you know what's going the first time you're watching this. You know what's going to go down. And once again, kind of like just talking about Jeddah, um, I think this final scene just has so much impact to it. Like, um, because with Jeddah shows you the destruction and how fucked up and like really adds mm. and makes the Death Star scary. And then it works so well because when the Death Star shows up here, you're like, oh shit. You know, like you're actually like scared of it. Because you know what's about to go down. And then when Jin and Cassian sit down on that beach and then they just get wiped to smooth rains and then that camera just kind of pans up from uh, from the planet there to Darth Vader arriving, then, yeah, that that scene does not get old. I Like, literally still just sitting here watching him when he's when all those re- the rebels are sitting there like trying to pass open that door and then you just hear that fucking lightsaber light up and then Darth Vader appear out of the darkness. It's like... Oh, so good. I wish, I really wish, 
I never wanted a Darth Vader solo movie until that scene. And then all of a sudden I was like, yes, I would like a Darth Vader solo movie. If only it's a horror movie and he's the villain and he's not the main character. <laughs> like I want it to be he's about Jason, other people. Yeah. Yeah, I want him to be Jason in a Vader movie, basically, and just make it like Tell you what, that end scene here. <laughs> Star Wars Publishing, we want an asymmetrical Darth Vader game. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it'd be really fun, yeah. Um, so does when anyone he gets closer, any- he just plays his theme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jaws theme. <saying, laughs> <laughs> anyone have any uh, final thoughts on this movie or the last scene or anything? This movie explains so much in New Hope that... It's it's weird to think that there was a time where we watched New Hope without having the knowledge of this movie. Like, I think this movie makes New Hope a better movie. I think it does, yeah. Like, yeah. it just, just does so much to make... Like, just the... I'll talk about it more next week, but just, like, having the, the, the questions filled in about why Darth Vader is so pissed off when he enters the ship on uh, at the start of the movie is just it just it, it's so understandable and so good that yeah it just makes that scene even better when we watch it next week ash any final yeah this is great i, re- I really love it how do you feel guys feel about talking this time watching through is it is this, this is distracting anymore i think i'm just used to it that I don't i'm used to it now yeah. care i'll think about it same with layer um, was that I, that feel? Like, I think still Leia, worse, but... Leia's worse for me. I think Leia was worse than Tarkin was. I, I, I don't know why. Like maybe it's because of the white lighting. <laughs> em, lighting and the environment that Leia's in just makes it look really weird. I will say, I will say though, for everyone complaining about this technology that they used in this movie, if they didn't use it in this movie or at least try, and like if they took the criticism that they shouldn't be trying to do this sort of stuff. A lot of stuff that's happened over in Marvel movies over the last pu- couple of years wouldn't have happened. Yeah, you know, because yeah. it's the same technology that they just keep working on and getting better at year after year after year, mm-hmm. and it's the same group of people. So it's like if they took your like if they took everyone's criticism from this and be like, no, you should not do it. It looks horrible. You know, then it's like you wouldn't have had the we wouldn't Downey have had Jr. and fucking whoever else. We uh, wouldn't have Samuel L. Jackson acting the entire movie. Yes. Where he do. looks like D, where he's like thirty years younger, like yeah, it's yeah. Just- and you're probably like, oh, it's a bit different because they're literally different, like actors being brought to life. It's the same technology though, just being used in different um, ways though. So um, it's like they could make it Rogue One today if they made it this year. That both Tarkin and Leia would look better because they just keep getting better and better and better at using that sort of technology. So yeah, it's fine, you know. It's only a couple of years old, but the technology grows so fast these days, I think. All right, so to the big question. Ash. This is the best well, one so I, far. Okay, I was about <laughs> to say, I sh- I'll just quickly read off everyone's list because I feel like I should. Okay. Um, so I currently have at number 10 in my rankings, episode two, I have Solo, episode one, episode three. Ash currently has episode two, episode one, episode three, solo. Kieran has episode two, episode one, solo, and then episode three. So what you're telling me, Ash, is that you want to put this at the highest position, which would be position six so far? Yep. You want to put Rogue One? Yes. Okay. Rogue. Um, Rogue. One. One. Oh, yeah. That, that's less Han. corny than the solo thing, by the way. Solo. You know? How do, that's, how do you feel about that one? You know, I had like, oh, what are that we? One felt more one. Than... That one felt no, more natural. That one felt way more natural. It didn't feel more natural. way more natural. Yeah, it feels yes, way more it natural. Yes, it did. It feels way more natural No, it was just way too one. much of a pause. Rogue One? No, I, I like it. I, I think it's fine. I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. Kieran, where are you ranking this one? Uh, Yeah, chuck it in that number six spot for me, please. <laughs> just chuck it in that number six. Would just you, chuck uh, it in up there at number six at the tippity top. Thanks. Chuck it in at the top there, would you please, sir? Um... Now I'm probably gonna move. It. <laughs> just, oh I, fucking I, hell! I, I, I just Below like Dylan. The I, don't know, I don't know if we're going to the point where Dylan's like, I'm just gonna start moving shit around to be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am. I am with you this week. I am also Ooh, putting okay. this one at number. This six. is probably one of the ones that I'd revolt about if you put below. Like below the ones we've watched so far, I'd I would revolt. 
Uh, so that makes our rankings uh, somewhat not very exciting this week, but you know, at least Solo shook things up a little, a little bit yeah. different a uh, week, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and I do think it'd be interesting. There. I'm, I'm just looking at it. You know, I'm looking at the list. And I'm like, all right, we'll see how we go. I think we're getting we're into now. the interesting part in the next six weeks. Yeah. yeah. Like the next six will be interesting. Yeah. All right. So next week's episode of Old Rain Explosion, we will be watching uh, Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope. So make sure you watch that movie before then. Please share this episode on social media and tag at Explosion Pod if you're enjoying it. Tell your friends and rate on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. Old Rain Explosion is a Darth production of ExplosionNetwork.com, which is where you also find what you want to watch, our fortnightly movie and tv podcast you can follow me on twitter at viva ladil v-i-v-a-l-a-d-i-l you can follow ash on twitter at ashley hobley a-s-h-l-e-y h-o-b-l-e-y and you can follow kieran on twitter at yup boy ringo until next week may the force be with you always <laughs>